This is Twit. This week in web browser tracking, uh, or maybe where there's a will, dot, 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 um, and there sure does appear to be a large amount of will behind browser tracking. I mean, it just must be that there's, it's just so valuable to know where we go on the internet and to be able to track us. And, you know, we've been talking about this from the beginning of the podcast, from the day this podcast was born 15 years ago, tracking was an issue. And of course it's enabled by the pervasiveness of, uh, well, entities like Google that have their hooks into us no matter where we go and also large advertising networks that similarly are pushing their own content onto websites everywhere. And it's that it's the pervasiveness of one entity that has a, you know, arranges to get our browsers to make a query back to them, no matter where we go, that that, that then wants to know, Oh, who is that? Who has made that query? What do we know about them? Um, And of course, I invested a lot of my time in the early days where third party cookies, you know, third party tracking, as they were called, uh, cookies and the forensics of those uh, I investigated back with some code on on GRC. You know, now the idea of using third party cookies seems almost as quaint as floppy disk viruses. But browser tracking is back in the news because a group of researchers from the University of Illinois at Chicago will be presenting this week their paper on the use of fave icons for tracking uh, during uh, this week's virtual Network and Distributed Systems Security Symposium, which is NDSS 2021. Their 19-page paper is titled Tales of Fave Icons and Caches, Persistent Tracking in Modern Browsers. For anyone who wants more detail, although you're really not going to need it because I'm going to explain this all, I do have a link to their 19-page PDF in the show notes. So, for those who are not aware, the Fave icon is the tiny little icon that appears typically at the left of browser tabs, and also, as its name suggests, when we save a website link as a favorite. Uh, so, for example, GRC has what I call the Ruby G. Uh, Twit has that cute little Twit and gate icon with an eyeball standing on its two feet. Uh, GRC's squirrel forums present the squirrel logo. And pretty much every site you go to will have its own fave icon. And yes, I've heard it pronounced favicon, but just as as a <laughs> lib, it, it, just as a lib. We know where you a stand. Library, we know where you stand. Yes. Yes. <laughs> a, a fave icon is a contraction of favorite icon. So no, I am not of the favicon. I am. I say favicon and lib. No kidding. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, you know, really well, the two point positions are the pronunciation is determined by what it's an abbreviation for, your position. Mine is the pronunciation is determined by how it is used in its orthography once the contraction is made. So if it weren't for that you knew that it was a favorite, if you looked at favicon, you would say favicon. But because you know it's so you're a favorite, saying you say it's orthography a... versus morphography. Perfect. Semantics <laughs> versus <laughs> syntax. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, and of course, we have GIF versus GIF, but let's not go mm. there now. <laughs> In any event, it turns out that, get this, all browser makers have assumed that since a whatever you want to call it, a favicon or a fave icon. Actually, kind of fa- favicon does kind of roll off the. Oh, anyway, St- uh, stick uh, with morphology. All <laughs> <laughs> since all browser makers have assumed that a fave icon is sent from a site that makes its flow unidirectional. 
So unlike cookies or web beacons or signals used for fingerprinting, the fave icon didn't need anti-tracking protection. And as a result of that, all browser makers cache their fave icons in a separate cache, which is never cleared when cookies are cleared or even when the browser's other caches are cleared. And <laughs> to add insult to injury, what's more, both the standard and the incognito mode interfaces of a browser share that single fave icon cache. So needless to say, if it turned out that there was some means of tracking users through fave icons, not only would it be immune from the user's deliberate anti-tracking measures of flushing this or that browser cache, but it could also be used to breach the security boundary between the explicitly no history being retained private browsing modes and the standard browsing mode. Since there's only a single fave icon cache, it would be possible to determine, for example, whether a browser had ever visited a site by see, like when it's in private browsing mode, by seeing whether it requests a fave icon from the site in question when not in private browsing mode. And of course, we know where this is going. I was quite curious to learn how these guys had pulled this off. Since a browser's retrieval of a fave icon is a binary event, either it doesn't have one yet, so it'll ask for it, or it always has one and thus doesn't need to ask again. The hack is rather brute force, but I'll give them a C for clever. So here's how they describe their work in the abstract of their paper. They said, the privacy threats of online tracking have garnered considerable attention in recent years from researchers and practitioners. This ha has resulted in users becoming more privacy cautious and browsers gradually adopting countermeasures to mitigate certain forms of cookie-based and cookie-less tracking. Nonetheless, the complexity and feature-rich nature of modern browsers often lead to the deployment of seemingly innocuous functionality that can be readily abused by adversaries. And of course, we've talked about all manner of those sorts of things in the past. They said, in this paper, we introduce a novel tracking mechanism that misuses a simple yet ubiquitous browser feature Fave icons or <laughs> favicons. They said, in more detail, a website can track users across browsing sessions by storing a tracking identifier as a set of entries in the browser's dedicated fave icon cache, where each entry corresponds to a specific subdomain. In subsequent user visits, the website can reconstruct the identifier by observing which fave icons are requested by the browser while the user is automatically and rapidly redirected through a series of subdomains. More importantly, and we'll talk about how that, the details of that in a second, more importantly, the caching of fave icons in modern browsers exhibits several unique characteristics that render this tracking vector particularly powerful as it is persistent, not affected by users clearing their browser's data, non-destructive, reconstructing the identifier in subsequent visits does not alter the existing combination of cached entries and even crosses the isolation of the incognito mode. They said, we experimentally evaluate several aspects of our attack and present a series of optimization techniques that render our attack practical. We find 
that combining our fave icon based tracking technique with immutable browser fingerprinting attributes that do not change over time allows a website to reconstruct a 32 bit tracking identifier. So that's unique 4.3 billion different browsers in two seconds. Furthermore, our attack works in all major browsers that use a fave icon cache. In other words, all major browsers, including Chrome and Safari. Due to the severity of our attack, we propose changes to browsers' fave icon caching behavior that can prevent this form of tracking and have disclosed our findings to browser vendors who are currently exploring appropriate mitigation strategies. Okay, so this works since subdomains also each get their own fave icons. So these guys set up an HTTP 302 redirection chain to take the user's browser on a 32 subdomain walk where the primary domain indicates whether this browser has ever visited this site before. So if the browser doesn't need that main site's fave icon, that's because this is not the browser's first visit. So the site sends the browser off across a chain of 32 subdomains of that main site domain, noting which of the subdomains the browser asks for fave icons from and which it does not. But it never gives the browser any new fave icons to store. That pattern of requests will be unique for that browser because if the browser does ask for the fave icon from the primary site, then the site knows that the browser has not yet been uniquely fave icon tagged. So now the site chooses a new 32-bit identifier, you know, increments a master counter somewhere to get a, a, a unique identifier, which it will assign to this browser. And it uses that identifier to judiciously and selectively dole out or not subdomain fave icons as it takes the browser on its 32 subdomain walk to match the 32-bit identifier that it has chosen for the browser. So yeah, it's kind of brute force. I think it's kind of clunky, but it's diabolical when you consider how none of our browsers have been treating their, five, their fave icon caches with the respect it is due. Um, the attack is currently effective against Chrome, Safari, Edge, because of course it's Chromium, and it was effective against Brave, also since Brave is Chromium, until the researchers gave the Brave developers an early heads up, which allowed Brave to, to beat the rest of the pack to the deployment of an effective countermeasure. And interestingly, Firefox, which I haven't yet mentioned, would also have been vulnerable to the technique. Uh, and in a sense, they very much wanted to be. But it turns out that a bug in Firefox prevents the attack from working. The researchers explained this. They said, as part of our experiments, we also tested Firefox. Interestingly, while the developer documentation and source code functionality intended for fave icon caching similar to other browsers, they said we identify inconsistencies in its actual usage. In fact, while monitoring the browser, meaning Firefox, during the attack's execution, we observed that it has a valid fave icon cache, which creates appropriate entries for every visited page with the corresponding fave icons. However, 
it never actually uses the cache to fetch the entries. As a result, Firefox actually issues requests to refetch fave icons that are already present in the cache. We've reported this bug to the Mozilla team who verified and acknowledged it. At the time of submission, this remains an open issue. Nonetheless, they said, we believe that once this bug is fixed, our attack will work in Firefox unless they also deploy countermeasures to mitigate the attack, which, of course, they would when they fix it. So anyway, it's kind of cool for Firefox. Uh, they had the cache. Turns out, due to a bug, they were never using it. So Firefox was always issuing requests for fave icons for all the sites we've been visiting and so was never uh, susceptible to, to this particular attack. On the other hand, uh, when they fix this, they will speed up Firefox. That's good. And presumably, they'll also deploy a fix for this, however they decide to arrange to do that. So uh, anyway, uh, everybody's going to fix this. They're all on it. Um, if anybody is really worried in the meantime, uh, you can. it turns out that all the various browsers provide some means for disabling their fetching of fave icons. I don't know why anyone would, but, you know, maybe just to reduce your fingerprint. Uh, I, I can't imagine not having those cute little icons on all my browser tabs. I mean, they're they're really handy. Um, but I do have three DuckDuckGo search links for Chrome disable fave icon, Safari disable fave icon, and Edge disable fave icon. If anyone just wants to click the links as opposed to putting it into their DuckDuckGo search engine. Uh, so it can be done. It's going to get fixed. It was sort of a clever hack. And uh, so, you know, props to those guys. Again, sort of brute forcey, you know, to store some combination of fave icons in 32 subdomains off of the main domain. But uh, it, it uh, you know, it could get a unique ID in two seconds. Maybe you could do it in the background uh, while a main site was showing you its page it would be sending, you know, some other resource off on that uh, 32 website redirection chain. You know, basically the, the, the browser pulls up a, a subdomain, it receives a 302 redirect, and, and meanwhile the browser has asked for the fave icon for that subdomain. The browser then goes to the next uh, domain in this chain, and that repeats 31 times. So... You know, kind of clever.